We were having a conversation yesterday about the work that you've been doing. Most recently, if you may have got this in the press, he was in Varanasi with the Indian Prime Minister where they launched an initiative for 5,000 widows in Banaras. This is his pet uh, project and he'd like to see a very specific way in which women are enabled and they are given dignity, which in India and probably in a lot of the world is not done. He has this report here called the World Widows Report, which probably is the only report done in the world. And I think Prime Minister Modi was impressed by the work done in this. So uh, Lord Lumba, why don't you tell us a little bit about this project? Well, I will tell you about the project, but first of all, let me say, that I do not have an empire <laughs> and don't know where you get your news from. Um, <clears throat> I do have a business in England, which I started from scratch, and thank God uh, it is well established, and my son is looking after it now. So therefore, I get actually a lot of time on my hands to do social work. I started this uh, charity, the Lumba Foundation, because of my personal experience, um, because my mother became widow at an early age of 37, and I was only 10 years old. And I saw firsthand her sufferings and prejudices and discrimination. And ever since my childhood, I always um, was wondering that why a woman, when she loses her husband, uh, that she loses her status in society, and there should be something to be done. And as I grew older, and I was, I became more and more determined to um, help widows and educate their children, because education is the main aspect of life of, of any child. And in fact, we are here today sitting in this conference, mainly because my friend Harjeev Singh is trying to bring people together from different countries to uh, uniting them for exchange of ideas and education, um, because that is most important. And one thing leads to another in life. Um, when I set up this charity, my core focus was to educate children of poor widows because my mother educated seven young children single-handedly, although she had never had any formal schooling herself. But she could do it because my father was a successful businessman and he left her some financial resources. But unfortunately, there are millions of widows in this country who are not as fortunate as my mother was. And we were talking about some innovative ways that haven't been tried before, that you are working on it, and you have a lot of support from the Indian Prime Minister. Would you like to tell the audience about that? Well, I think this cause has, had never been addressed by any nation, including United Nations. That's what I discovered in 1997. And therefore, I took this lead, and I wanted to make this as a global cause. And I do get huge support from both Indian and the British governments, as well as from the United Nations. And uh, because of that, I have been able to raise awareness of the plight of widows around the world. In 1997, there was not a single global charity uh, around the world which addressed the problems of widows. There were some local charities. Then in 2005, I launched International Widows Day um, at the House of Lords in England because I wanted to make this a global uh, cause. Well, it was a global cause, but I wanted to make sure that everybody knows about it. And after that, I have never looked back. And it was a question of, you know, kehte hai, I main chala tha akela, zindagi mein, log milte gaye. Chudte gaye. 
क्या कहते हैं कारवा बनता गया एंड टुडे इट हैज बिकम इन ए मूवमेंट इन द वर्ल्ड एवरी कंट्री नाउ इज इन्वॉल्व इन सपोर्टिंग एंड हेल्पिंग दर विडोज आई एम गेटिंग ह्यूज सपोर्ट फ्रॉम इंडियन प्राइम मिनिस्टर्स एज प्रीति जस्ट टोल यू दैट ओनली टू टू वीक्स अगो द प्राइम मिनिस्टर ऑफ इंडिया श्री नरेंद्र मोदी लॉन्च्ड माय रीसेंट प्रोग्राम इन वाराणसी फॉर फाइव थाउजेंड विडोज देर आर नाइन्टी थाउजेंड विडोज इन वाराणसी अलोन इन इंडिया देर आर फोर्टी सिक्स मिलियन विडोज हु हैव मोर देन हंड्रेड मिलियन चिल्ड्रन एंड दे आर रियली एट द मर्सी ऑफ अदर पीपल बिकॉज दे डोंट हैव एनी रिसोर्स दमसेल्वस and the prime minister was very pleased and he personally launched the pro project not because it was his it is his constituency but uh, he genuinely wants the widows of this country to be supported and helped and during my speech i called upon him to set up a national commission for widows and he was quite happy to consider it and i'm sure sooner or later there will be a com commission for widows in this country and that will help widows in all the state thank you very much we'll come back to some of the other uh, the context in which widows are treated in the world and some other paradigm shifts that you've talked about last evening uh, devashish we were talking about your foundation doing uh, really large scale innovative work with the government of india in transforming education uh, for urban children living in poverty would you like to please talk about that sure thanks priti so uh, a quick uh, introduction uh, i represent the michael and susan dell foundation this is the family foundation of michael dell and his wife susan dell we are not the csr arm often people make that mistake um, and the mission of the foundation is how to transform lives of children who live in urban poverty through education health and better family economic condition uh, all these areas are massive portfolios for us but i'll focus on just to answer priti's question we were talking about it and why that is relevant for the discussion topic of today is about skills um, we believe that uh, fundamentally unless and until there is a, a acceptable quality of school education that's made available to the a large number in a population skilling can only be a repair job at the end and that too for the very low skilled jobs if if children have to enter the emerging job whether it is digital world whether whatever you know more knowledge based work investment and revamping of the schooling system is integral to the skilling so i'll come to that later so um one of the things therefore we as a foundation uh, strongly believe that one cannot sort of just write off the government system and say oh nothing works so let's go and run some parallel systems to educate the size reach and the investment of government cannot be matched by anybody else so just to give you a one example uh, right now we are uh, working under the leadership of the very very progressive and bold i think leadership that has come from progressive governments in haryana to transform all the 15000 the government schools in that state to deliver quality education so learning level improvement is the ultimate objective so this is a multi year multi stakeholder significantly sort of a very complex but the two points i'll make over here in the interest of, uh, in the interest of time one tremendous leadership coming from the government because this is the government taking leadership and we are the supporters Uh, one cannot sort of do it to the government government has to show the leadership and they are and we are very very excited with the response we are get, getting from various state governments to replicate the model that's in haryana so haryana what is trying to do in in a very in a nutshell it's a very complex project is look at every aspect of education that uh, ultimately plays into the role so what is the governance process so uh, for example the chief secretary of uh, haryana today in his regular meeting has an agenda on education and education with data that is being delivered on how learning level change is happening this is a this is a very significant change you know education often has been seen as enrollment 
uh, midday meals, etc. But what about the quality of education? And then from there onwards, right down to the teacher, what are all the things that are to be changed to uh, make it happen? For we were also talking about how the teachers in government schools are, are given a bad rap, but actually they are doing their best and they just need more enabling resources that you were providing. Correct. And the kind of specific data that you talked about sure. in the classroom, that the sure. teacher will know where the student is lagging and teach exactly to that level. Sure, no, great point. So for a, I think uh, to Piti's point, we really believe that of course, there might be a a uh, so minor uh, share of teachers who might not be motivated, but the teachers in government schools actually face an impossible task we have given them. Their classrooms where they have no data on how the children are doing, what uh, in a class five does, which ch child in the classroom does have problem conceptually on a, you know, on a two digit multiplication carryover. Unless and until she has that data, she does not know how to teach and address that. So, Large scale, the state has taken an extremely bold step to do learning level assessments across the state, scientific learning level assessment, and that data is going right to the administrators, etc., but going right back to the teachers as a report card to show where their individual children are and how they can work. So I can talk to you about various aspects of it. So, uh, you know, how to sort of redesign in the pedagogy, how to even change the uh, annual performance review sort of mechanism of the teachers to imp include in that learning level as one of the metrics. So it's a massive multi-year program, but we are very, very excited with the leadership that is coming. And we believe education cannot be solved school by school. Uh, in a, uh, one uh, aspect of education by aspect, it has to be taken on a, um, an a overall basis. And, and an important point that you were talking about was that this is funded by the government. Correct. You are a support resource, uh, somebody who has brought the expertise, but the government really owns it, it funds it, and uh, you know, it takes responsibility and accountability for the results. Absolutely. So we do not uh, go for any government projects unless the government essentially says, it is my project, I own it, I yeah. fund it. All I need is certain amount of expertise and best practices, but come create the coalition to drive it at a strategic level. So right, yes. right. Uh, thank you for that. Shailaja? Sure. Uh, I'd like to add to the things that have been said. I think uh, in the world of skill development, the buy-in of the government is essential. And I'd like to take, since I'm an economist, indulge me a micro and a macro perspective. And I'd like to thank the Dell Foundation because we just completed a research project which was jointly funded by DFID, UK Aid, and, and the Dell Foundation. And that was evaluating a government-initiated program in the state of Tamil Nadu called Activity-Based Learning. We submitted the report last week. And what is interesting in India is we have a huge number of educational innovations. But like we have heard about startups, some of them rise and fall before they scale up. It's an expensive proposition. Um, we've heard about corporates yesterday who rise and fall and they have budget lines, but with the government experience, given that we are looking at the children who are the least privileged uh, and government schools are for them, and really with the demographic bulge, we need to look at them, it's important to look at what government schools provide. The activity-based learning model, which was started in Tamil Nadu, rolled out across Tamil Nadu, and three features I'd like to explain. One, it was teacher driven. So the teaching materials were not taught to the teachers, the teachers <coughs> developed the material, testing each other, and then using the same material to work with the children. It's also a challenging flip method because the child tells the teacher what she wants to learn and the teacher works with each child. And so, in a government school, which is well-resourced, you can have better levels of learning. That was the first thing we found. The second thing we found was there was a challenge in disseminating the educational innovation. So Tamil Nadu government had a, like you're saying, uh, Debashish, a state government that was bought into it. When it was rolled out to the next adjoining state, that's the Union Territory of Pondicherry, that government, because of its particularities of Union Territory, was not able to fund the process. And if you can't fund the new teaching cards for that state, because MHRD holds the funds rather than the state government. So here's a classic economic problem. Decentralization doesn't work between union territories and states. However, ABL has been picked up by 
DFID, by the World Bank, by others who are in India, and saying, we found these children more confident. And these are kids from OBC backgrounds, migrant kids. They're not your confident urban kids. Why am I using this micro experience? I want to link that to the macro, if I may. Because these young children, when they finish school, will come to the city looking for jobs because we don't have a great deal of employment in rural India. So from the micro perspective of this study, which we've spent a whole year doing four studies, if you're interested, the report will be publicly out next month, it really shows that when education is provided as an opportunity, there comes with it an added responsibility for corporate India, for governments in India, for civil society, and that is how do we ensure the employment matching for this kind of education. And so the other project that I'm involved in, if I may, which is a project which is jointly funded by Government of India, DST, Department of Science and Technology, and the British Department for Business, Innovation and Skills, is looking at youth aspirations. And here we've selected two states closer to home, to Delhi, Punjab. Uh, in the state of Punjab and the state of Tamil Nadu, as those of you as old as me remember, the Green Revolution technology actually brought about improved incomes in rural India. But nobody who is a successful farmer at $15 a day wants their children to be farmers. They want them all to get university education and do something else. But the thing we're finding is, what is this do something else? There's still that idea, even for rural youth, I want to be an engineer or a doctor. Well, we have a number of educational institutions that don't meet the grade else. for that in India. So one of the things that we need to think about with youth aspirations is improving the asymmetry of information between better institutions and worse institutions. We only read a few weeks ago three girls killed themselves in Tamil Nadu because they went for a medical course that wasn't recognized and they had to pay fees. So we have a challenge at both ends. And I just want to pick up on that. What is this do something else? What is the aspiration of young India so they don't want to become plumbers and drivers and mechanics? So where are the new jobs? Who is going to skill them? And I think you, your company, your foundation has come up with a few companies that are models for what could these new jobs look like that are aspirational. Could you talk about sure. that? Sure. So one of the, and uh, I think Shailaj's point again, just to underscore, uh, without basic education, a lot of the other things will fail. But given that all this are uh, talked about that today there's a demographic dividend has become a nightmare, there's a now cliche. So what can we do today and now for kids who need help? And one of the most, I think, biggest problem in the vocational training area is uh, that uh, constantly one hears, oh, children have too high aspirations. Mm -hmm. I don't think there's anything wrong to have high aspirations. All of us had high aspirations, that's why we are in this room today. Question is, how do we try to match it? So I'll give you one example of an innovative investment. So it's a company in Kolkata uh, named iMerit. So iMerit is a BPO that employs students are from uh, uh, in a peri-urban and, and the uh, uh, sort of surrounding areas of Kolkata, mostly from the rural background, who have done class 10 or 12, and then give them very targeted training that allows them to become digitally uh, informed and digitally capable. So what's the effect of that? This BPO with this sort of background are, uh, is today the back office of Uber, of, uh, of uh, you know, TripAdvisor for eBay, and these students are actually doing jobs which we have as a, we have a myth that unless you are an engineer, you cannot become uh, a digitally, you know, digital worker. It's wrong. Question is, how do you train them? Now, this might not be the solution for the hundreds of millions of children, but we constantly are trying to push the envelope as a foundation to say, if there is an aspiration gap, what can we do? And this organization, I invite you, any of you, to look at their site, etc., is doing a fabulous job. In fact, in the recent um, you know, so Startup India event, Travis, who is the head of uh, uh, Uber, specially called out this organization to say, we are so delighted that our back office is being handled by an organization like this that is being run by uh, uh, employing this. And this is a for-profit company. Uh, you know, this is a sustainable, scalable for-profit company. So many other examples like we are trying yeah. to push where we do not sort of tell a great class 10, 12 pass, uh, uh, okay, your future is to become a security guard or a beautician. I think mm -hmm. that's what has really uh, you know, uh, affected this whole uh, uh, you know, sort of aspiration issue. Yeah.
pretty I mean, it's fantastic, these girls sitting in Bengal and suddenly they are working in a call center, talking to clients in San Francisco. This is the sort of public-private partnership model, perhaps, you know, that has the solution. I'd just like to add to that, if I may. Yeah. So uh, we've completed uh, a certain amount of work with IIT Madras on youth aspirations. I couldn't agree more with Debashish. Aspirations is what makes the Googles of the world and the Martin Zuckerbergs of the world and equally all the young Indians who will do similarly. The, the question really is, is those aspirations are asking for jobs that we didn't have in our generation. So just because we're older, we don't necessarily know what those are. And a lot of it is learning how young people learn, if I may use that expression. So what we found, and we've done this with mobile phones, so we have a work with the University of Pisa, which has a public domain app called Portaland, and offline, if someone wanted to know about that, we can talk about it. But we're able to try and understand when young people access their mobile phones. So Android came into India in November 2014. We did our first survey in February 2015, three months within, with the bottom ones, the Lavas and the Micromaxes, at about 6,000 rupees. Of our sample across three districts, 96% of the young people, this is age 18 to 25, had mobile phones. That doesn't surprise us. But 56% of them had an Android. And this is within three months. And they knew the facility that Android provided. They were using for Flipkart and Snapdeal. These are people at $20 a day. But what was more interesting is, and because we work with IIT Madras, we could look at the peer-to-peer -peer as part of the project that we devised. They were talking from regional engineering colleges, so these are kids across, Two IIT Madras MTech students saying, OK, so I'm using English, but when can I use may and when can I use can? Wow. And this student was writing back in Tanglish, it could be in Hindi, you know, saying, this is when you would do it. And the student writes back the next day and says, I don't think I got it right. And everyone in IIT, when we're looking at the back-end data, was surprised. They said, we thought there'd be engineering questions. How do you get into IIT? But only 40% of the questions were educational in that sense. 60% was about the good life. And at the end of that one year period, we had put in an additional questionnaire. And they said, we really just enjoyed talking to people, this is the power of social media, who we wouldn't otherwise meet. Sure. And that's, I think, at the core of some of this aspiration. So I just wanted to share that with the group. And I think that cultural confidence and that social networking that uh, transcends classes and economic classes especially is absolutely essential uh, for, for this. I want to come back to uh, the cause of the widows that uh, Mr. Lumba is championing. We were talking last evening in the context of how this happens globally, because one tends to think that this is an Indian issue, mm -hmm. but how it also plays out globally, and it's a very emotional, you know, I'd like for you to give some examples that you spoke about that okay. still persist, and this is why we need to take up this cause so seriously in India. Yeah. Um, well, we need to take this cause seriously, not only in India, but also around the world. There are 259 million widows in the world. And India is the most leading country with 46 million, and then China, 44 million. You will be surprised that there are 13 million widows in America. So widows are spread all over the world. And they have 584 million children. They say when you add their dependents, the number swells more than a billion. So it is a huge problem. Now, in each country, widows suffer differently, which can be well understood because of the cultural, tradition, and other um, economic reasons. For example, in India, it is a social stigma, a widow when she loses her husband, she is ostracized by the relatives and the community. And, but in sub-Saharan countries in Africa, widows are actually suffering much, much more than India. First of all, they become widows because their husbands have died because of HIV. So once she loses her husband through HIV, Nobody in the family wants to know her. And the tradition in some of these sub-Saharan countries is that a widow is supposed to marry the brother of her late husband. So now, and, and he inherits all the um, wealth. Now, he takes the wealth, but he does not marry her. He marries her in name, but does not really look after her or after her children. So she becomes destitute. That is one problem. 
Then there are some ritual problems in sub countries like Ghana, uh, Botswana, um, you know, there are about 10 or 12 different countries uh, which are all listed in this report where the traditions are so um, deplorable that you won't even believe them. In some countries, widows are made to drink water which is wa used for washing the dead body of her husband. And that is incredible. And this is the tradition she has to drink water. Then in some countries, there's a cleansing process where a widow has to actually make sex with the brother's, uh, uh, late husband's brother. And if brother isn't there with father-in-law, if father-in-law is not there, anybody on the street. Now this is dehumanizing a woman. This also gives rise to more HIV. So it is a terrible problem and a lot of the people in the world don't even know it. These are the kind of things which we brought to the United Nations attention. And in 2010, <coughs> at the General Assembly, the United Nations recognized International Widows Day, which takes place every year on 23rd of June. That is done despite the fact that they have International Women's Day, because they realize that the widows are victims of double discrimination. Particular kind of discrimination. Yeah. Uh, the, the two of our panelists spoke about how the government, uh, you know, you have to co-opt the government to make uh, a big change. You have suggested to Prime Minister Modi to set up the National Commission for Women, but within that context you were talking about how the Panchayati Raj system can yeah. be enlisted in this. In fact, there are three ideas I have, and one of them I have already put forward to the Prime Minister during Varanasi launch, and that is that the government of India should consider setting up National Commission for Widows. If the United Nations can set up International Widows Day in spite of International Women's Day, why can't Indian government set up National <coughs> Commission for Widows in spite of National Commission for Women? That's my logic. Second thing is that the country is vast and there is 70% uh, population living in rural areas. And it is the rural widows who suffer the most. They don't suffer in Delhi, they don't suffer in Bombay. They're educated, they can get a job, and they're independent, they can remarry even. <laughs> Nobody's stopping them. But in villages, the life is very much confined, and widow is uneducated, widow can't get a job, widow can't remarry. Therefore, and, and therefore, the in-laws really blame her for, you know, that because of her, our son died. And they, in an <coughs> indirect way, punish her. They give her hard time. They abuse her physically, psychologically, and even sexually. And yes. yet, she does not know who to turn to. She hasn't got any resources. So therefore, I am suggesting that we have a very good system in this country of Panchayat Raj. It is, Panchayat is situated in every village and there should be a, one person who is totally responsible to address the problems of widows so that she can come and register her complaint, get guidance and get some solution to her problem. That, that's an excellent suggestion. I hope Prime Minister Modi takes this up. I'm sorry to interrupt, but I have to open the floor to Q&A. We have but, 10 minutes. But there's just one sure. very two minutes. The third problem, um, idea I have is that government of India is setting up 27% reserved jobs for Dalits and minorities. Widows are also minorities. You yeah. know, 46 million out of over a billion population, you can't say it's not a minority. So therefore, they should reserve at least 5% jobs uh, for widows. It's an and, excellent idea. And that would also give them some uh, avenue, uh, you know, 
to, to work and earn money and look after their children, get them educated as education is most important. And uh, you know, this will also help in some way. I think those are three excellent suggestions. I'd like to have the audience ask some questions if you'd like to of any of our panelists. Please identify yourself and ask a short, crisp question. I've got a, I've got a response to any of yes. questions. I just want to come, one, I want to say thank you to Lord Lumba. It's usually me as the woman who asks the gender question, so I'm absolutely delighted <laughs> that he's taken this opportunity. But I want to say two things. Uh, there is no reason that a widow cannot be economically empowered. Uh, one is, and there are many things in India that we don't join up with, we do. So I want to give an example from Africa, as Lord Lumba did. I've worked in East Africa, I work on, on, on rural villages and smart villages. We ha had a group of women, wi widows from Rwanda. Of course, they have many, many widows because they've had a terrible genocide. And they came to India to Barefoot College to learn yeah. to do solar energy. And these two women are age 49 and 51, so they're my age, but they're widows. And and they were very quiet and shy because they had, you know, were excluded from their own villages. Yeah. After six months of training without a word of any Indian language or English, they learned, they went back, they became masters, they've electrified their whole village. This is with support of the Rwandan government, UK diaspora, uh, Rwandans. But what was interesting is they stood up and they spoke in an East African meeting which I had organized for five countries. And they said, we wear the trousers, literally and financially. Because in Africa, women only are wrapped in cloth and they're not allowed to climb. These women climb on top of their houses and their neighbors' houses and they build solar panels. It's a wonderful example. Uh, on, on, this, on this point, may I come also? I have been to Rwanda a couple of times and uh, I have seen 500,000 uh, uh, widows in that country who were, you know, uh, victims of genocide in 1994. And, and it is terrible the conditions they are living in. And you know, the country is poor. So I'm very pleased that you are helping. We'll go back to the UK and do something more for this. Yes, yes, we can. <laughs> uh, so you know, there, there are a lot of problems with widows all over the world. But some, somehow the problems are kept under carpet. Nobody knows, nobody wants to uh, address them. They are invisible, forgotten, and they are the sufferers. Yeah. Uh, do we have questions Thank here? You. Otherwise, I'll ask no, Devashi to make some back. closing remarks and the rest okay, of the panelists. Yeah. Sure. So, <clears throat> I think the, in closing, I think we have all touched upon it, but just to summarize, uh, I think the country today is paying attention to skilling um, for making sure that uh, the population that is unemployable gets employed. And uh, that's absolutely necessary because we have a crisis on hand. And we have to do a variety of things, including constantly pushing and saying, what is the emerging uh, sunrise industries that we can train our uh, in a, in a, in a people for? And I don't mean sunrise, just meaning IT. You know, even in technology, is, uh, in construction, I mean, construction, what is the most modern technology that's coming in? What is in, in the housing sector, et cetera? How do we train for that? Because that is where the, the wage differential comes in. So that's one part of it, that we need to do all those things, including aspiration. But just to leave, uh, again, I think a couple of us talked about this overemphasis today where the pendulum has completely swung towards let's skill, skill, skill. I think it is ignoring and neglecting what we need to do to b fix our basic education. Mm -hmm. If we don't do that, there is no way uh, we will ever be able to meet the aspirations of the younger generation that's coming in. They don't want to become, like Shailaja is saying, that they don't want to become a farmer. They don't want to necessarily have their choices restricted to become a laborer. So unless and worldwide, any research you look at always shows that the you know, the skills, the higher order skills, which is necessary for the emerging industries and the emerging world requires a basic level of quality education in the schools. You cannot make them answer. So please let us all focus on the education side as a continuum that will feed the next generation of skilled workers um, in, in, in the country. Thank you, Debushish. Yeah. And I think some of those examples that you talked about would apply to widows too, yeah. why, why they can uh, also benefit from the same. We should become partners. Yeah. <laughs> Absolutely, sure. Uh, do you, you all, want you, me to say yes, something? Please. Could you have some uh, closing uh, remarks? Yeah. Very quick yes, one. Uh, yeah. Could we, yeah, go ahead. Uh, 
uh, who's going to uh, fix our cars? Do we then start talking about that? I don't think it's, it's a mutually exclusive. Yeah, no, Your cars that was fixed when my father used to drive an ambassador, and the car that is fixed today, which is a Maruti, skills are different. Cars will still be fixed. It is a question of how do you constantly upgrade the skills for the modern world and not have the people skilled only to work on the roadside, you know, fixing. So it, I don't think the question is who is going to do it. Question is we cannot sort of box them and say that's all that you can do. So, so broader discussion, but I don't think that is the objective to say let's restrict the skills so that some of the basic jobs get done. I don't think that really works. Can I give two, two just one? Sorry, can we yeah, just have course. him give some remarks and then yeah, well, close in exactly one minute here. In, in my closing remarks, I would like to go back to Varanasi and just mention that these 5,000 widows with, who we are empowering, they are receiving vocational skill training in tailoring, a very professional two months training by Singer Sewing Machines. Once they complete and they get the competence certificate, then we give them a sewing machine so that they can become self-reliant, they can start their small business or work in a factory, earn money, educate their children, because education is the core um, work of the Lumba Foundation, and support their family members. The Northampton University has done uh, impact report on my project and they have s proved that every widow we empower will actually help 10 people in the family. Three children on average will go to school, six members in, on average in a family will get the support uh, from this uh, um, uh, enterprise. And I hope that if uh, so, this becomes successful, so it becomes a case study to so scale up in it India. Is, so they, they, therefore, it will help 50,000 people. Now, like that, we have now in, in the process of empowering 15,000 widows, 5,000 in Varanasi, 5,000 in Punjab, and then we are in uh, Pondicherry, in Delhi. We are actually helping widows in three jails in Delhi, uh, in Bihar, in Hyderabad, in Sirkakulam. So there are about five or six different states where we are empowering widows. And I think that is the way the Lumba Foundation wants to go forward in addition to advocacy. I think thank we you. should thank him for taking up a cause that nobody else has in India. And getting, and getting the Prime Minister's attention, I'm hopeful that there will be significant change. Oh, by, by the way, the British Prime Minister is also a patron <laughs> Even of the better. Lumba Foundation. <laughs> Even better. Yes. My closing you. remarks, I'd like to respond to that question, but as, yeah. as part of the closing remarks. Um, I don't think it's uh, improved skills at one end without improved skills at the other end. I'll just take the two examples, one already, Debashish, I'll take the other one. You don't want your cook only to make dal chawal, you also want to make Thai spring rolls. Okay, so if you want Thai spring rolls, you need better skills. Um, and this is the challenge, and this is why I'm glad we have this, this discussion after the Smart Cities one. As we get more digitalized, the service provision that we want and the providers need to be more savvy. So youth are savvy, we want other service providers to be savvy, and there is an interest in technology across the spectrum, irrespective of income or age. And so I think what we're doing is a better matching of supply and demand as rural yep. India will increasingly become part of urban India if we don't want social upheaval.